I'll start um, by seeking refuge in God from the curse of Satan. And I'll welcome all the Muslims here with Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. And I welcome all the Christians as well that are here and, and, and thank the organisers for, for hosting this event with a, with a hearty welcome and I, and I genuinely hope that at least so far there's been something uh, interesting for you and hopefully I'll be able to follow that along and uh, that may be the, the continuing theme of the evening. So I'm going to be talking about, first of all, what we say about the Qur'an and then what the evidence says about the Qur'an. Uh, I think we've kind of probably started our presentation somewhat similarly. And then secondly, I'll be looking at the New Testament more exclusively. Uh, certainly the, the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures is by far more my field of expertise, but I hardly really thought it would be extremely relevant for uh, a room of predominantly Christians to listen to uh, Old Testament textual criticism. So I'll be focusing on the Qur'an and the New Testament, and perhaps during the rebuttal period I might head to referencing some of the Old Testament a little bit. So what do we say about the Qur'an? Well, essentially, we say that it was a book revealed to the Prophet Muhammad by the angel Gabriel roughly about 1,400 years ago. I'll just get the summary up for you. Over a period of 23 years in Mecca and Medina, which are, which are towns or now cities uh, in modern-day Saudi Arabia. Uh, it certainly wasn't Saudi Arabia back then and, and was basically just a, a land of varying tribal uh, groups. There was certainly no single political or cultural identity other than really the speaking of Arabic and some you know, fundamental cultural norms that were sort of followed amongst the, the tribes. So we also believe that the Qur'an was revealed in, in what's called seven ahruf, okay? The, the singular of that word, harf, essentially means words or particles, okay? Now, it might be a bit difficult to sort of get your head around coming from, I guess, a, a, an English New Testament sort of perspective, knowing that all of the New Testament basically comes in, in one language in Greek. And indeed, we're saying that the Qur'an was only revealed in Arabic, but at the time, because of the the differences between the tribes, there were a few dialectual differences. And we believe that the Qur'an was revealed in all of those different dialects. Okay? In terms of the exact nature of the difference, we don't really speculate. We now know, or we believe, that the, the Qur'an we have now is united onto one harf or, or one dialect, and, uh, and that's what we're going to be focusing on from here on in. Certainly, as Samuel quoted, the prophet peace be upon him, instructed that the Qur'an be written down during his lifetime. Now, it wasn't written down on paper, it wasn't written down on a book, simply because paper didn't really exist at the time. Um, you know, there were things like vellum, writing on bone, that sort of stuff, but writing down on paper and certainly having a bound book was not really an option, particularly given the desert climate. Okay, as Samuel also summarised, we believe essentially that, that Abu Bakr who was the first caliph or the first president uh, after Muhammad, peace be upon him, then collected the Qur'an again. And we believe that the reason for this is because uh, a, a range of uh, reciters and those that had memorised the Qur'an were dying, not just due to old age, but also in battles and, and uh, the conflicts that were going on in the early Muslim period. And so in order to ensure that the Qur'an could be sustained in, in, in what we consider to be tawattur, or, or, or a perfect manner, or a certain manner, um, Abu Bakr had to ensure that there were at least two witnesses for every Qur'anic verse. Okay? And that's certainly a, a Qur'anic injunction, that for any fact to be established, there must be two witnesses. So basically Abu Bakr was trying to follow the Qur'anic injunction of having two witnesses. Moving on, we believe that Later on, Uthman, who was the second after Abu Bakr for the Islamic presidency, so to speak, um, also asked for the uh, Qur'an to be united, but this time onto one dialect. Okay? And there were two reasons for that. One, because Islam had spread beyond the Arab lands, there were non-Arabs that were combining dialects, different dialects, in reciting. And this, first of all, had the potential to change the meaning. But secondly, as the Arabic written language was starting to develop, people were spelling words differently. Okay, they were spelling words differently. And so because of that, it was important that the text was united onto not only one dialect, but also one mode of spelling. Right, so we'll move on from there. 
What do the academics say about the Qur'an? Well, very quickly, there's only a few options available for them to sort of stick to. The first one is that our account is more or less correct. Obviously, the, the non-Muslim academics aren't going to agree that the Qur'an has a divine origin coming from God, but they may say that our account is more or less correct, that it just comes from Muhammad or some other Arab at the time. Okay? The other option is that our, our tradition isn't exactly correct and that there were later additions, say, 100 years or so after the death of Muhammad. Another option is that the Qur'an didn't exist in its current form until about three or 400 years after Muhammad. And then the final option uh, is that the Qur'an was actually written in Syriac. Um, now, the last two options, I've underlined them uh, because they've recently been disproven, absolutely. So, as an individual in the audience, you can prescribe to one of the, the, the first two options, basically. Otherwise, you're going to be flying in the face of non-Muslim academics. And what is the academic evidence? Well, first of all, I'll say that there is strong academic evidence to support what we say. Okay? And essentially, most non-Muslim scholars will agree that our account is more or less correct. And I've just put up a disclaimer there so you know that I'm not trying to lead you in the, the wrong direction. Obviously, they don't accept that it's divine. Okay? But in terms of what we say, it was collected at the time of Muhammad, it was collected again at the time of Abu Bakr, it was collected again at the time of Uthman, they'll agree with that. In terms of our overall claim that the text hasn't changed during that period, they essentially agree with that. And I'll be giving you some quotes in just one moment. One of the major supporting arguments for this idea, and this is why the two uh, latter arguments have recently been blown out of the water, is that the Islamic political climate was so tumultuous in the early period of Islam, after the death of the Prophet, that it is, it is impossible for the text to have been altered and not contain at least some details about that. Okay, so for example, favouring one tribe over another. Because the tribes were, was, you know, at a significant uh, amount of war immediately after the death of, death of the Prophet, vying for the Islamic presidency. And it was a conflict that went on for hundreds of years, basically, and didn't end until the Mongols came and conquered the Islamic Empire. So you can probably appreciate that if the Qur'an was fluid during this period, there would be some, you know, political leanings during, uh, you know, introduced during that time, and there are none. Moreover, the manuscripts are essentially uniform, okay? And what I mean by essentially uniform is that as far as the, the, the foundation goes, they are uniform, okay? For those of you that don't know, Semitic languages, so Hebrew uh, and Arabic are included in Semitic languages, have no written short vowels, Okay? They're later introductions to make recitation easier for, for non-native speakers. So the examples that we looked at with, with Samuel a little bit earlier are actually differences in short vowels that are, that are far, far later introductions to the text and to the writing system. All right? In terms of the, the foundation of the text, the root words, there are no differences in any manuscript. And anywhere where there are manuscript differences, and I'll, and I'll talk about one, um, they're corrected in antiquity. And in terms of the recitation differences, I'll probably be able to speak about that more in the rebuttal. So just very quickly, a couple of quotes from academics here. Uh, Wernsborough's hypothesis of a very late crystallisation of the Qur'an text outside of Arabia is not in accord with the internal evidence of the text itself, which implies a very early crystallisation, <laughs> i.e. before those civil wars I, I was just referring to. Okay, now that's from Fred Donner in 2006. The, the reference is there if you'd like to jot it down and check it for yourself. He's not a Muslim. Okay, this is what he's concluded about the Qur'an. He's a professor of uh, Oriental and Semitic Studies at a university in, in the United States, I think Pittsburgh. Andrew Rippon has also said, in 1972, a treasure trove of ancient manuscripts of the Qur'an were discovered in Sana'a. Certainly, the existence of the manuscripts indicates that the text, or at least extensive parts of it, um, were well in existence by the 8th century. So that means by 700, so rough, roughly 50 years after the death of Muhammad, peace be upon him, the Qur'an was certainly in existence. Okay, again, a non-Muslim scholar. And the, and the reference is there. What about the differences between the Hafs and Warish recitation? Well, I'll just speak about them quickly. Both are verbal transmissions of the text, okay? Now, this again might be a bit hard for you to understand in a Christian context, but for those of you that do know at least Hebrew, you'll know that there's at least three different recitation methods in Hebrew for, for reading the, the Hebrew scriptures. 
Okay, that's basically what we're talking about here with the Quran. It doesn't change the root text. It's just changing the recitation method. It doesn't change the meaning. It just changes the recitation method. And I'll actually look at a couple of examples, but first of all, quoting Adrian Brockett, certain differences between the two transmissions, so he's speaking about Hafs and Warsh, and again the reference is there, at least in the copies consulted, occur consistently throughout, none of them has any effect on the meaning. Now what does that mean? All this points to a remarkably unitary transmission in both oral form and written form. Okay, so basically here's another non-Muslim scholar concluding that our version of events is more or less correct. So let's look at some of these differences. Now for those who are at the back, this might be a little bit hard, um, and I've put the English transliteration there for you. These are actually differences between the Hafs recitation and the Warsh recitation that are quoted on a, on a website that I know Samuel's contributed to called Answering Muslims. And here there's a couple of differences. Now you can see that, well, from the way we look at it, that there are consonantal differences, cons differences in consonants. And you're probably thinking, well, hang on, he just told me that there's only short vowel differences. Well, I'm not going to speak about the short vowel differences. I want to give you some consonant differences so you know that I'm really not trying to pull your leg. The thing that I really want to hammer home is, first of all, for those of you, I hope everyone can see it, the dots above and below the Arabic letters do not exist in the original Arabic written form. Okay, so when the Quran was first written down, these dots above and below the Arabic letters did not exist. Now, these dots aren't short vowels, they're consonant markers. Okay, consonant markers. So, for those of you that don't know, Arabic's read right to left. So, in the first two boxes we've got over here, you'll see that the, the first word begins as a sort of a U-shape with two dots at the bottom. That means ya, yeah, okay, or a Y, okay. On the corresponding word in the different recitation method, it begins with two dots at the top of that U-shape. That means ta. Okay, now you think, well, hang on, that's a different consonant. Surely that changes the meaning of the word. It doesn't, because the root of this word here is about to speak. Okay, it just changes the tense of the word. It doesn't change the meaning of the overall sentence. Okay, going down, we've got another consonantal difference. Okay, again, you can see with dots, the consonantal difference is regarding the, the fourth letter. Okay, it sort of looks like a, an upside down R. All right. In that instance, it actually does correspond to an R. Right? In the second one over, with the dot at the top of it, it means a Z. Okay? So we've got, in using the, uh, the Latin transliteration, the words nunshizuha and nunshiruha. Okay? Now, these words actually have different specific meanings individually. One says to cover, or one means to cover, one means to propagate. Okay? But in the sentence in the Quran, it's referring to covering the, the uh, bones of, a, of an animal with flesh. Okay, so one saying, cover the bones with flesh. The other one saying, put flesh all over the bones. Okay, so hopefully you can at least get a bit of a rough idea that these differences in meaning uh, in the individual words don't change the sentence itself. And it kind of indicates that given that these dots didn't exist in the first sort of century or so of, of, of the Quran, that somehow the meaning was maintained without even the consonants being specifically um, maintained. So going on. The key issue here, but is as I said, there's no difference in the root of the text. Now we call that the rasam, the root of the text. Okay, so that's all these Arabic words without the dots. Okay, and without the short vowels. There's no difference there. So I'm sure that you can at least appreciate that graphically from up the back even, the words in the two boxes there that correspond to one another look very similar. That's all that you really need to appreciate from that. So, was the Qur'an ever written like this without dots? Well, certainly it was. Here up on the left-hand side, I've got a very early manuscript, and again, this is going to be very hard for the people up to back to see, so many apologies, with no dots. Okay, no dots for the consonants, and no short vowel markers. And these additions to Arabic came over time. So, here we've got a later manuscript. It comes about 100 years or so later. And again, it's going to be very difficult for you to see up the back, but there are red dots starting to appear resembling or uh, 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 meaning short vowels and black dots for consonants. Okay? Now, this isn't the modern method that's used for writing. Okay? But that's not the issue that we're discussing here. We want to discuss whether the, the foundation of the text has been maintained, and certainly the manuscript evidence is that it has. Now, if you'd like to look at some manuscripts yourself, again, I'll have references up towards the end, and you'll be able to then 
take a look on the internet. One myth that's often propagated is that we don't allow scholars to look at um, Quranic manuscripts. Well, in fact, the United Nations has a website with thousands of old Quranic manuscripts that anybody can look at freely. Um, I encourage you all to take a look. So there's the references there. I'll just leave that up for one quick moment. And if you don't get to write it down, there'll be time afterwards. So what do we say about the New Testament? And I've started there with a quote from the Apostle Paul about wisdom of the world being foolishness for God. We certainly believe that Jesus, peace be upon him, received a revelation somewhat similar to Moses and Muhammad. In terms of the specifics of that revelation, we don't know. Okay, we don't know. We certainly don't believe that the gospel accounts are reflective of that revelation in toto. And even the nature of the gospel accounts are not reflective of the revelation. The gospel accounts are, you know, Mark's version of events, Matthew's version of events, Luke's version of events. We believe that Jesus was given a revelation, say, similar to the Torah, similar to the Pentateuch. Okay? We also believe that that exact revelation was then subject to distortion, okay, over time. And we don't mean necessarily over a period of a thousand years. In a very short space of time, distortion can set in, and we're going to speak about that. Some argue that the Qur'an suggests that the New Testament at the time of Muhammad was not distorted, but there were no Arabic Christian scriptures until about 300 years or so after the death of Muhammad. Okay, so I'm not really sure how that argument kind of holds water. Ultimately, we believe, as I said, that the text in its current form is not reliable in, in total, but that it does contain some elements of what was there before. So why would this matter to us? Well, it may, may surprise the Christians, but it's very important to us because of what the New Testament suggests. Okay? The New Testament suggests that Jesus is God. The New Testament suggests that Jesus can save us from sin through uh, his crucifixion. The New Testament suggests that we don't need to follow any ritual laws. Now, I mean, if the New Testament is telling the truth, then we really want to know about it. You know, I think I speak for all Muslims in the room when I say it would make our lives a whole lot easier day to day. At least give me 25 minutes of the day. Um... So it's very important that we assess the reliability of the text, okay? Because it's not just the message that we're concerned with, all right? I want to know, is the message being conveyed in a reliable manner, all right? And if it's not, well, then obviously I've got no interest in the message. And if it is, well, then I need to consider it. So in the same way that we look at the Qur'an, and remember I said we grade the Qur'an as being certain, um, and we don't grade a hadith necessarily on the same level, but how we grade the Qur'an as being certain is essentially through this sort of method, and it's basically a modern textual critic's method. First, we look at manuscript age, or in terms of the early history of the Qur'an, we're looking at the authenticity of the reciters that came and claimed to have verses. Okay? We look at the, multipli uh, the multiplicity of the manuscript. In terms of the early history of the Qur'an, we looked at how many reciters knew specific verses. We also look at the quality and assess for any potential bias. Okay? So again, for example, with regard to the Qur'an, if there's a verse that's been propagated that's essentially, say, Shia in theology, well, then we'll know about it. Okay, all these factors help us to assess the reliability of a text. So what are the facts? Well, certainly we agree that the Gospels are today the most historically reliable documents in terms of account, uh, accounting Jesus' life. Um, we know that there's roughly 6,000 Greek manuscripts. The New Testament was originally written in Greek. No two pages are identical. Now, again, I've got an honesty disclaimer there. By identical, there are some that only have a couple of spelling differences, you know, one or two letters. But there are some pretty big differences that we're going to speak about as we go on. For example, verses that aren't in the oldest and best Greek manuscripts. And also, we're going to assess the issue that the earliest synoptic gospel documents that we have today appear 100 years or later than when they would have initially been written. So knowing those two facts... How is it not at least possible that the originals could have been distorted? So the earliest New Testament document is a portion of the Gospel according to John, and I've got it actually up here and down here for you to see. That's about as big as a credit card in real life. Okay, It's written on both sides. Um, it contains a few words of uh, chapter 18 of John. And that corresponds to basically all other manuscripts and, and you know, the, the modern version that you have in your hand today, okay? And it certainly shows us that that portion of John, at least, has existed for a long time. But what does it tell us about the rest of the book? Absolutely nothing, okay? Because the original was written at least 50 years or so before. 
let's consider all the Gospels. Well, Matthew, in terms of traditional accounts, would have been written around 50 to 80 CE or the first Christian century. And the earliest manuscript we've got is dated to around about 180 CE. So we've got a gap of almost 150 years, taking it out to the maximum length. Are there variants? Yes, there are. Verse 44 of chapter 21 doesn't exist in that manuscript. It just goes straight from 43 to 45. Okay? Mark and Luke, again, there's discrepancies of greater than 100 years between the earliest evidence that we've got of these Gospels existing and when they would have actually been written. Mark's actually almost 200 years. And as I said, John is only around about 50. Now, what are two quick facts that we can ascertain from this? First of all, three quarters of the Gospel accounts have no evidence of existing within 100 years of, of them actually being written, the time that they should have been written. And even in the ones that we do have the earliest evidence, there are small variants and some significant variants. An entire verse missing from a manuscript that's only got about five verses. That's pretty significant. All right, so what does this mean? Can we be certain about the originals? Well, I don't think so. As a Muslim, I'll say now, I don't think so. If I did, I'd be a Christian, okay? Because looking at even these simple facts, what did the Word of God originally say? How can I be certain that the crucifixion actually happened? How can I be certain that everything that is detailed in the Gospels is actually real? Well, I don't think I can. Let's consider some, some of the big sections. Now, I've, I've just picked the ones that even modern-day Christians agree upon. First of all, the chapter ending of the... Uh, sorry, the, the ending of the Gospel according to Mark. There's three different endings. Nobody knows which ending is the real one. Okay, there's different assumptions made, but no one knows which ending is the real one. This is an entire ending of a Gospel, okay? Next, the story of the adulteress in, in the Gospel according to John. It doesn't exist in the earliest manuscripts. In fact, it doesn't exist for almost a thousand years after the, the Gospel of John would have been written. You know, why is it still there? There will be, you know, little marks in modern-day Christian Bibles saying these don't exist in the earliest manuscripts, but why is this stuff still there? Okay, the John Comma, speaking about the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, it's not supposed to be there. It's not in the earliest manuscripts. So, yes, you know, it's great that there are some things that haven't changed, but these things quite obviously have changed. What does that tell us about the rest of it? So if this were the case, well, there'd be hints that the text had been distorted somewhat. So, you know, the text wouldn't agree with itself. So we start off with the Gospel according to Mark and it says it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. Well, no, that's from Exodus, that's not from Isaiah. You know, books that are separated by about a thousand years. Fair enough, the next verse is from Isaiah, but that one's not. Okay? Another hint is when the fundamental concept, concepts are ambiguous and I'll come back to this point just because I'm noticing the time. Okay, but wait, there's more. You know, set of steak knives as well. Um, in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus says, I will never drink of this fruit of the vine until the day I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. Okay, at the Passover meal. Only a chapter later, when Jesus is on the cross, he's served wine mixed with uh, gall. So did, you know, did he forget that that was going to happen? Did he not know? What about in the Gospel according to Mark? It's, it's not wine mixed with gall, it's wine mixed with myrrh. Okay, myrrh, for those of you that don't know, is a sweet-smelling perfume. Okay, gall smells disgusting. Gall's poisonous. Myrrh is something that for centuries, well, thousands of years, has been added to Middle Eastern and Oriental food in small amounts to, to add flavour. Completely different articles. So which one's true? They can't both be true. What are we relying on? Are we relying on scribes? Well, no, because we know that they made mistakes. As I said to you, there's no two pages of the 6,000 Greek manuscripts that exist that are identical. So we know that they at least made minor mistakes. What about early church fathers? Well, did the early church fathers even know everything that was in the Gospels? Let's consider a quote from Origen when he's refuting uh, an early pagan uh, critic of Christianity, uh, Celsus. Origen says, in none of the Gospels current in the churches is Jesus described as a carpenter, because one of... Celsus's uh, criticisms was that, oh, well, God would never be a lowly carpenter. Okay, we know now that in the Gospel of Mark it says, isn't this Jesus a carpenter, son of Mary? Chapter 6, verse 3. So did he forget about that? Did he not want to quote it because it didn't really suit his apologetics at the time? Or did he not know about it? There's only three options. Translators, well, maybe. Well, what about if Moses has horns? Anyone that's seen the statue of Moses by Michelangelo will know that translators make pretty big mistakes. You know, Moses obviously did not have horns. Um, what about Paul? Well, Paul says in uh, the letter to the Galatians, 
Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. However, in Acts 16.3, he circumcises Timothy, who was a Greek, so that he can minister to the Jews. Okay? Later, in the first letter to the Corinthians, Paul explains that he's a Jew to the Jew, a non-believer to the non-believers, weak to the weak. Basically, he assumes whatever identity he needs to assume in order to propagate the gospel. Now, would any truth coming from God need to be propagated in such a manner? I don't think so. Is this the method of a holy God? I don't think so. Yes, the Lord may work in mysterious ways, but I don't think he lies to us. Okay? Closing up, is anything I've said here really that new? No. Early pagan critics of Christianity, and this is in the second Christian century, criticise the same things that I'm speaking to you about now. First of all, it's saying that the Christians themselves have corrupted the gospel from their original integrity to threefold, fourfold and manyfold times. Okay? This is a quote from, again, the same pagan, Celsus. I'll just take time for my rebuttal if that's all right. Um, this is, a, this is a, uh, a quote from another early pagan critic of Christianity. And I've got the whole quote up there, but I'm just going to read out the parts that are important. The evangelists were inventors, not historians, of the events concerning Jesus. For each one of them wrote an account of the passion which was not harmonious, but as contradictory as could be. And it quotes some differences. From this out-of-date and contradictory record, one can receive it as a statement of the suffering, not of one of many. Oh, sorry, not the suffering of one, but the suffering of many. Okay, meaning that surely this isn't talking about one man that was crucified, it's speaking about three or four. It is plain to see that this is a discordant invention and either view points to many who were crucified or one who died hard and did not give a clear view of what his passion was. So either the message of Jesus wasn't clear and that's why we have gospel discrepancies or they're not true in the first place. Okay? And simply, uh, obviously, it opens up the door to criticism for every other aspect of the gospel in the New Testament indeed. Um, the quote for that and the reference for that is also there. And that's my conclusion. Thank you very much.